This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto. On May 23, 2015, Dr. Peter Vronsky of the History Department of Ryerson University spoke to the Institute on Canada's first modern battle, the Battle of Ridgeway in 1866. Thank you, Pat. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here, to uh, speak here and to see that portrait of Otter, who, who actually fought at Ridgeway as a very young man and was part of the regiment that, that fought at Ridgeway. Um, I wrote this book really as a dissertation at, at UFT. Um, and I, I wrote it after traveling for 20 years, covering kind of the last years of the Cold War, um, from South Africa up to Chechnya, roughly. And, and after 1990s, I started feeling nostalgic for Toronto, for my hometown, for kind of the sanity of, 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 of Canada. And so I. I returned here wondering a lot more about my own history. Um, as I was in these remote places, um, I began to think of, you know, what is the equivalent in Canadian history to, say, the Russian colonial conquest of, of, of Chechnya in the 19th century? Um, what was happening in Canada? And, and a lot of us Canadians really don't care that much about our history, find it kind of dull. And, and, and so I returned back to Toronto and uh, decided this might be a good time to take a scoundrel's refuge and go to grad school. Uh, and I thought that maybe one good way to look at my hometown is look at it through at its underbelly. And so I began writing a history of the Toronto Police, which it's one of the oldest police forces in, in the modern world, one of the oldest modern municipal police forces. It's Toronto's police is older than NYPD. It's older than the Boston police. Um, you know, we're founded 1834, just a mere five years after the London Constabulary. And at that time, the chief of police was uh, Chief McCormick, and God bless him, he just opened up his archives. Uh, I could just wander through the police archives which are stacked, or were stacked in the mid-90s, inside the parking garage at police headquarters on Collins Street. <laughs> Some of the archives were being used to push hot air up to the upper floors. So they were jamming old books, order books, into the ventilation system. Get to get that air going. And so one of the things that I just pulled out of one of the ventilation vents one of the first things I pulled out were Toronto police orders from the summer of 1866. And, and, and I crack open the book, and inside there's a report how the Toronto police are escorting prisoners of war to the jail, the central jail in Toronto. And I'm looking, June 66, prisoners of war. What the? <laughs> what war? I've never heard of a war. Uh, and I'm a product of the Ontario educational system from the 1960s, 1970s. So, you know, when it was a decent system, I should have known about the Fenian invasions. I should have known about the Battle of Ridgely. I hadn't heard of it. So, as I started pulling on, on this string, my whole history of the Toronto Police just went out the window. Um, and the closer and closer I, I, I kind of walked to Ridgeway, uh, the more it became about about this this battle, uh, this battle that that so many Canadians um, have completely forgotten about. Um, it's lost in between, you know, that epoch of the American Civil War, which which you know was such a threat to Canadian society at that moment, and of course Confederation, all the Confederation debates. It's as if nothing else had had, had happened. Ridgeway, I argue, you know, why I call this the battle that made Canada, um, I argue that 
you know, Confederation happened on paper. It happened you know, in July 67 is when it, our nation comes together on paper. But I think in our hearts, in our sense of who Canadians are, Canada was made at, on the fields of Ridgeway in that battle, in that crisis. Um, Canada comes together. We're in the middle of a national crisis. Confederation occurs at a time when habeas corpus is suspended in Canada. Uh, we're uh, facing what we think is a massive, what today we would describe as a terrorist uh, threat. And, and, and certainly I, I, I don't want to you know, characterize certainly those Fenians that invaded Canada, that early generation of Fenians, as, as terrorists. We can call them insurgents, we can call them you know, tribal militias, we can call them a nationalist movement. Uh, whatever label you want to you know, put on them. But this was a, a, a severe military national security crisis during which our nation was put together on, on, on paper. The battle is a very real battle. Uh, and it takes place approximately two hours drive from here. Um, you don't need to go overseas to see where Canada's first casualties actually uh, fall. Uh, just outside of Fortier, Ridgeway, outside the town of Ridgeway. And it's actually two battles because Ridgeway is fought on the morning of June 2nd, 1866, but in the afternoon there's a second battle in Fortier, probably Canada's first modern urban battle fought inside the streets of Fortier in the afternoon. And, and, and so together, these two battles collectively have become known as the Battle of Ridgeway. You'll find them referred to as Limestone Ridge, the Battle of Limestone. Um, there's various names, but Ridgeway basically is the name that, that has taken us. You're looking at the iconic representation of the battle. This is a uh, Fenian print. It's a lithograph from Buffalo from 1869. Um, you can see that the Fenians are flying a flag labeled the IRA. And they're wearing green uniforms. The Canadians, you can recognize as the guys running away. <laughs> And of course, they're uh, in the scarlet. And of course, the Fenians are obsessed with fighting the Redcoats. In fact, of course, uh, the Irish Fenians did not wear green at all. They were wearing mostly American uniforms. Some were wearing Union, some were wearing Confederate. They, they were uh, mostly Civil War veterans. And, and our side, wore green and red. In fact, the Queen's own rifles came on the field in the green. And here you can see the, the, the pioneers from the Queen's own, as they are today, essentially wearing the same authentic uniform that would have been worn at that period, armed with Enfield muzzle-loading single-shot the rifles. And there was a second regiment, an infantry regiment, or at that time, battalion from Hamilton, the 13th. And here you can see again uh, the 13th Battalion. Today, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, the Rileys. That's their ceremonial guard. And they pretty much would have looked like as they are in this photograph back in those days. It's a war often because it's fought at 40 years. Often it's a battle that people confuse with the War of 1812. And it's a completely different epoch. I mean, these are the grandsons of the guys who fought in the War of 1812. Although I've come across accounts of several War of 1812 veterans showing up with smoothbore uh, muskets to, to join in. The QR, of course, is a rifle regiment, would have fought mostly as skirmishers operating independently, while the 13th Battalion, as an infantry battalion, fought in traditional line uh, formation.
This is probably a more accurate portrayal of what that battle looked like. It wasn't fought in line. It was fought as, as a modern battle with skirmishing. Uh, there was a house, a brick house that they fought for and was fought across farm fields, orchards, and bush, and a ridge on top of that. Our own militia, uh, of course, our pedigree of the modern militia today, of the standing primary reserve regiments today, goes back to the Militia Act of 1855. Uh, we trace our ancestry to that, to that act. But, you know, the militia was kind of limping along until 1861 when the Civil War breaks out and you have the Trent crises. And now there's a fear that the United States, the Republic, might invade Canada. And so we now start modernizing in 1861 our, our militia. And in fact, the Queen's Own Rifles, they're formed in, in 1860. Various loose companies are pulled together. It makes the Queen's Own Rifles today the oldest Canadian infantry regiment still in service. And the companies are formed mostly like social clubs. Uh, one company is, uh, consists of teachers, school teachers. Another company is merchants. There's a company of university students from University College, Company 9. And, and in fact, they try to keep them out of the battle because they're young boys. And so the university boys are held in reserve and because they're held in reserve, they're thrown into battle last and they end up advancing the furthest of all the units and they take the brunt of a very experienced Fenian counterattack. Three of them are killed and there's a memorial to them that stands just opposite Queen's Park, Toronto's oldest public monument where in the 1890s our first Remembrance Day is going to be commemorated. At that time it was called Decoration Day and Remembrance Day was commemorated in June on the anniversary of Ridgeway during the South African War. It was commemorated in June during the First World War before we ever had a November 11th Armistice Day. It was in June. And after the First World War, it was in June until you had the Remembrance Day Act in 1930, which moves Decoration Day to November 11th to bring it in harmony with the Empire. And at that moment, all the boys who were remembered, who died at Ridgeway, there were nine of them who were killed in action there, uh, they're forgotten. And they're forgotten to this day. It's as if we disowned them. We broke our promise to them that we will remember. We don't remember them. They've been abandoned. And, and, and there's a large movement afoot right now for us to bring those boys home into our memorial books, into the remembrance books, into the Remembrance Day tradition uh, because they fought here in Canada against an enemy that came across our border defending our home and, and they should be remembered for that. And of course the QR, they are, they're all from the QR, Nine. And, and they've been nicknamed recently the Ridgeway Nine. They're led, uh, of course, by elite members of Canadian society, not by virtue of their military experience, by virtue of their prominence and wealth. Uh, it's a social thing to lead a regiment, and prominent Torontonians, Canadians, are fighting each other in the, these bitter political wars and who's going to command which regiment, who's going to get the glory. And so uh, some are good leaders, some, as in the case of Ridgeway, are, are, are not as good. You're actually looking at uh, Colonel Alfred Booker, who leads a brigade against the Fenians at Ridgeway. Um, and, and he makes a mistake. You know, and and it, 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 it ruins his career. Um, it also ends up ruining the reputations of these two regiments to this day. They're fighting right now for battle honors, these two regiments. Uh, 
Um, and, 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 you know, again, it was a luck of the draw, whether you had a good officer or a bad officer. It wasn't about training, it was about, you know, who they might be. Here's the, a professor, Professor Croft. He's the guy who forms the, the ninth company. Um, he, you know, he's well-meaning. He galvanizes the students at UFT to come fight it. Athenian invasion. The students actually are told they don't have to write their final exams, that their marks will be averaged out if they turn up. Um, and, and, and so these boys are desperate to sneak out of their homes because, of course, parents are holding back their kids. You're not going, you know, to fight fight the Irish. Are you crazy? Right? You're just staying at home. And so they're all sneaking out of their, their, their house to get out of exams, to get on the field. Um, and, and again, as I say, they end up the brunt um, of the attack. Uh, Croft never shows up on the battlefield. He stays at home in Toronto. He sends his boys to die. Um, and, and of course forever it will haunt him because the boys are brought back dead to University College. Their bodies are laid out in pine boxes in University College Hall and, and Croft stands there weeping over the boys. They're still in their soiled uniforms lying in these pine boxes. Toronto mourns. So there is this, as I say, elite aspect to the command. The men themselves, and, and again I, I refer to them as boys, but look at these photographs. These, this is actually uh, a, a company from uh, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, and you can see how young some of these boys are. I mean, they're literally boys. This is 10th, uh, you're looking at 10th company of the QOR, the Highlanders. Kids. Half of them had never fired live ammunition. And, and you can imagine the complexity of loading a muzzle, muzzle loading rifle. Half of them had never fired ammunition. They entered into battle with no canteens, no water, no food provisions. Some of them had not eaten for 24 hours as they were shipped by steamships across Lake Ontario. They got on a train down the Welland Canal, no food. Some of them got uh, dried fish on their arrival. They were drinking water out of ditches on their way. Who was the Minister of Militia? John A. MacDonald. That's one reason you've never heard of this band. Because John A. MacDonald's reputation, of course, to lead Canada as its first Prime Minister, could have been very severely damaged if the right people weren't blamed for the disaster uh, at Ridgeway. The Fenians, you will read that the Fenians were a drunken mob, drunken Irish chaotic. Fenians actually were very disciplined, crack, experienced army that came here. These are guys who survived countless apocalyptic battles in the Civil War, a war that killed 620,000 Americans. 2% of the population was wiped out. Many of them served in crack Irish brigades. And they came to Canada all the way from Tennessee, Ohio. There were some Fenians that served in the Confederate Army, the Louisiana Tigers, who got all the way up here. Half the Fenians who invade Canada are Protestants. This is not a Catholic thing. This, is, this was a Republican thing. It was not a religious war at all. It had, had no aspects of that. This was strictly a nationalist movement. And there's a secret society, and there is a Fenian secret society based on the Esplanade in a tavern here. Michael Murphy is the Tor Toronto Fenian who runs it, the police are aware of him, he's being spied on, he'll be arrested shortly before the Fenian invasion. They fly the rising sun as their flag. 
and they fight under the name the Irish Republic Army. Irish Republican Army, that's the first time that nomenclature is used. The plan is not to conquer Canada. The plan is to take Canada and hold it hostage and precipitate a crisis in the British colonial system in Ireland. That's the idea. So it's not a harebrained idea, you know, it's often portrayed all oh, those crazy Fenians wanted to conquer Canada. There is a lot of rhyme and reason to what they're, they're, they're doing. Um, and it does precipitate a crisis, not quite the crisis that the Fenians had, had wanted, but it's the beginning. That was the idea. And you got to remember that the Fenian movement also was the largest nationalist organization in the United States. There was over a hundred thousand card-carrying members of the Fenians, the Fenian Brotherhood, which is operating openly with a headquarters in, in New York. Um, and they're encouraging their members to join the United States Army and get training and fight in the Civil War so that you can then liberate uh, Ireland afterwards. And that works well for the United States government as much as it does for the Fenians. So it's, it's something that's encouraged. And, and, and certainly 100,000 could have taken, had they all turned out, could have taken and held uh, Canada. Wouldn't have conquered it, but held it. O'Neill, who leads the attack into Canada, uh, is a cavalry captain. He's a specialist in uh, mounted anti-guerrilla warfare in Ohio. He breaks the Confederate Morgan's raiders at Buffington Bar. Uh, he charges them on horseback, takes their artillery, breaks, breaks them. He's, he's, he's a heroic uh, leader, very, very smart experienced, and of course a Fenian now leading that attack. We don't have many photographs of him, this is one of the few rare images of O'Neill, Colonel O'Neill. It's Canada's first modern battle. It's, it's the first battle that Canada fights with rifled weapons. It's the first battle that Canada fights with telegraph. It's the first battle we fight with steam power. It's the first battle fought in parliamentary democracy. It's the first battle fought with newspaper, with print, being distributed by telegraph. It's the first battle where public opinion makes a difference. This is not the battle of, you know, the, 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 the War of 1812. It's not even the rebellion of 1837. It's a whole other world. And you've got to remember too that, that since the rebellion and, and the Patriot um, Hunter Lodge in, raids into Canada in 1838, that Canada was at peace essentially. We, have not, you know, we didn't have wars against native Canadians here. We did not fight to expand our frontiers here. It was a very peaceful society. We were not ready for war the way the Americans were, were ready having fought so many wars in that period while we lived in peace. So we were not prepared for this when it happened. The invasion uh, happens in the night, June 1st. They rent barges and some 1,500 Fenians cross the Niagara River. They seize Fort Erie, capture it, cut outgoing telegraph lines, but keep incoming telegraph lines, especially those to the United States, intact. They cut off a bridge, Sourwine's Bridge, and cut the railway there, burn down the bridge. And then they position another picket at Black Creek. So they seize that, that, that region there that you can see. First Fenian camp on June 1st is located there. The Fenians are seizing tools, shovels, axes, horses, food. Uh, they're moving like a foraging army. And every time they stop, they build palisades and, 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 and breastworks, defensive systems. Um, the Canadians 
we're stumbling about. The Fenians have county level road maps that they've taken out of schools. Spies, Fenian spies have taken these county maps out of Canadian schools. The Canadian army, our militia and the British army, have no maps. They have to tear their maps out of postal almanacs. And, and all they have are like postal, postal routes. They don't even have road maps. So the Fenians actually know our own territory better than we do in defending it. One thing we have to say is that the Canadian response is amazingly rapid. Uh, the Fenians, as I say, cross around uh, midnight of June 1st, 1 a.m., you can say June 1st. Uh, by 8 a.m., the QOR are already on a steamship, the Toronto. They've already been shot across Lake Ontario, and they're on the Welland uh, Railway going down the Welland Canal. Um, I would argue that, that the Canadians being able to be deployed there within 12 hours is something that the Canadian military would not be able to do today if, if uh, you know, let's say 1,500 terrorists armed with state-of-the-art infantry weapons crossed the Niagara uh, River. You know how long it would take for our militia to get the ammunition that they have locked up somewhere in Camp Borden uh, and respond. You know, it would be cops responding, SWAT teams. We probably have to pull together all our, our SWAT teams. We were better prepared then than we are today. So by noon, already the QR in, in, in Port Colbert. A regiment from Hamilton, the 13th, are also sent in by the evening in their position. And now the two colonels get into a fight. Who's going to command now this brigade that's being put together? Um, and of course, Booker has like five days more than Colonel Dennis at that point, and so Booker gets to command. And Dennis gets his own mission, which I describe, and unfortunately, the chaos that that becomes. You know, it's in my book, but we won't have time to write. The British are stationed in Hamilton, two regiments there. And so the British are deployed towards Niagara Falls, towards the suspension bridge. They first sweep by, deploy troops on the suspension bridge to prevent it from being seized by the Fenians. Um, and then, as June 1st comes to an end, the question is, is where are the Fenians? How are we going to find them? Are they here? Or are they there? Or are they there? No one is sure. Uh, making matters worse, the British confuse our geography. They confuse Black Creek with Frenchman's Creek. And so the British plan, the orders that are cut and sent by telegraph, and I suspect that the Fenians were in intercepting our telegraph message, is that Booker is to march his brigade through Ridgeway towards Stevensville, where they're going to unify with the British Army and then together, they attack the Fenians, who they think are at Frenchman's Creek. But they're not. The Fenians had actually forced march through the night and are at Ridgeway. And, and Ridgeway, they knew where they were going. This, this was not by accident that the, the Fenians ended up at Ridgeway. They had surveyed Ridgeway at least a year before as a battlefield. And so Booker is actually marching straight into an Athenian ambush. And the only question we have right now is whether Booker knew that the Athenians were already there waiting for him, because a lot of people were warning him. And did he want to take a run at the Athenians without the British? You know, ambition. That's where the battle is going to take place. You can see the terrain. Still today, the road is essentially the same as it was. This is an original map uh, drawn by a captain from the Hamilton Regiment. You can see it's mostly at that time it was agricultural land, apple orchards, wheat fields. This is what the terrain looks like. And you can see the kind of view you have. The ridge is a very subtle ridge. But you can see, you can see for kilometers from this ridge. 
It's the perfect place to lay an ambush. You'll see the enemy coming. That's why it was chosen. Skirmishers from Kentucky, from Ohio, from Buffalo, are formed up. Some on the ridge. And the idea is, is to pull the Canadians into a cauldron, into a flat piece of land, into here. So they can be ambushed from the ridge, from high ground. You can see the ridge. This is the actual battlefield, what it looks like today. And you can see the subtlety of, 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 of the ridge. But anybody who shoots knows. What, what, what that slight rise, would, what kind of advantage it would give you if you're positioned there. Skinner, uh, sorry, uh, Booker uh, leads the brigade by the book. He's an auctioneer in Hamilton, he's prominent Hamiltonian, very politically connected. Um, he was the liaison with the British Army in Hamilton during the American Civil War when we were awaiting an invasion. And he's very ambitious. And so as he comes against the first skirmishers, he deploys first the QOR go in. One company of QOR are actually armed with Spencer repeating rifles, which they're given on the ferry for the first time. Never fired a Spencer. They have no idea if a round jams in it, how to clear it. Right? You know, you have to pull the magazine out, no idea. One crate of Spencers is actually falls off the ship and it was found maybe 10, 15 years ago as they were building uh, those buildings on, on the you know, Union Station extension. They actually found the crate of Spencers that were dropped in there. It's in the Toronto City Archives now. So it is at first a skirmish. Um, it is, of course, ground chosen by the Fenians. Canadians have to climb up over these rail fences, exposing themselves to well-placed Fenian fire. And again, remember, uh, half the Canadians have never fired a rifle before. Fenians are all hardened combat veterans. This is another contemporary image drawn by an artist, this is, there's these watercolors in the collection of the Ridgeway Museum, uh, drawn by a, a, he's a Canadian, but he comes with the Fenians, uh, an artist that corresponded. It's a fairly accurate portrayal of what that battle looked like again. There is where the first casualty occurs. Malcolm McEachern, Ensign Malcolm McEachern. Malcolm McEachern is a Sunday school teacher. He's leading Company 5, the Spencer Armed Company. Um, and as he turns to remove a rail from a snake fence so that they don't have to climb up over it, he takes a round through his, through his abdomen. Malcolm McEachern is Canada's first modern combat casualty from the modern army, at least from the militia part of it. He dies 20 minutes later. He's carried across the road. And he dies 20 minutes later in a cabin on that field. The Fenians fall back. Canadians pursue. By now, the guys with the Spencer rifles, oh, by the way, the QR left Toronto each with something like only 10 rounds of ammunition. Standard load going into battle was 40 rounds to 60 rounds. They leave with 10. The Spencer Rifle Company had 27 rounds. Fortunately, uh, the Hamilton Regiment had spare cartridges, but they didn't have enough caps. So the, the QOR, you know, the, the riflemen at least got another 10 rounds but not enough caps to go around. The Spencer armed company blasts off all their rounds, as everyone fears, especially if you're using a Spencer rifle for the first time. They blast off all their rounds in the first, you know, 10 minutes. They're, they're gone. Now they're pulled back into reserve. And now Booker starts <laughs> deploying 
the line infantry, the red, the scarlet. In fact, the Fenians later report that they, didn't, that they only saw scarlet. They didn't know the QOR were there. Um, and, and, and of course, the, the Fenians are just you know, focused on seeing the redcoats. In fact, the Fenians think they're fighting the British Army, not the Canadian Army. The fighting gets heavy around a, a building known as the Brick House, right there on the crossroads, Birdie Road and Ridge Road. <coughs> the house still stands there. You can see the university rifles. In the end, the university rifles, Company 9 and the Highlanders fight all the way my pushes right into the Fenian counterattack. They take, as I say, the brunt of the attack. The Canadians fight into the brick house. They clear Fenian barricades that the Fenians had built that morning there. They take those, they kick in the door of the brick house, they begin to use it as a fortified point. They're firing out the windows. There's the house today. The house is still pockmarked from many round hits. One company of the QR are left. In fact, a section of Company 6 get across the road with 3rd Company of the 13th Battalion. And now, disaster. There's a curve in the road. Booker goes into battle on his horse, but the first round that flies over him, he leaps off his horse and sends that horse back. Uh, smart move, of course, but, you know, commanders are expected still in that time to command off horseback so they can see the field. Uh, Booker ends up taking cover behind a barn, so he can't see the field. And now somebody shouts out, Fenian cavalry. Newspapers will report that it was a cow. <laughs> it could have been Fenian scouts riding up. O'Neill was on horseback. In any regards, Booker doesn't see what's happening. When he hears cavalry, he instinctually gives the command that he has so often given on parade grounds. Form square. And now they form this square in that curve of the road, but there's no cavalry, there's only Fenian infantry marksmen. And now the Fenian infantry open fire on the square, this nice tack tightly packed square, and that's where we start taking the heaviest casualties. And now Booker desperately wants to try to reform his men, and, and it's too late. Panic begins to hit. And, and now, of course, O'Neill, who's an experienced officer, sees the Canadians hesitate. He sees their attack suddenly stall, and now he gives the order for the entire Fenian force, approximately 700 men, so it's one, almost one to one, fixed bayonets, <coughs> and they start howling, a Celtic charge, barefoot, and, and, and of course it breaks the Canadians, um, and it breaks the Canadians in the reserves, in the rear. It's the rear that starts falling apart because the guys in the brick house, the Hamilton infantry, who are going to be blamed by the Canadian press, by the Canadian historians, because Skinner was actually the regimental CO of the Hamilton regiment. And so now the boys from Hamilton are, are, are going to be going down with Skinner for this mistake. In fact, the guys from Hamilton are fighting in the brick house. They have no idea that the ranks behind them are breaking apart. In the same way as Company 9, who's, who's now fighting this Fenian, mass, massive Fenian charge, doesn't know that the reserves are breaking. Fenians sweep the Canadians off the field. It's, it's, it's a rut. It's a retreat. 
And that's the day you'll never hear of this battle after that. It's celebrated, of course. This is the first victory by the Irish over the forces of the British Empire since the Battle of Fontenay, 1745, when the Irish wild geese charge the Coldstream Guards and break the Coldstream Guards, scatter them like pigeons. Now, this is the first time the Irish get to face the colonial armies and, and, and they're victorious. This is, this is huge. We have no lithographs on the Canadian side. We have no posters. It's all coming out of Fenian imagery. In fact, this poster was hung by the town of Ridgeway on their Main Street as, as Main Street banners a couple of years ago. Um, and all the United Empire loyalists came out with squirt guns. Call, and they labeled them Fenian soakers and they started squirting uh, the city's posters. Huge, huge scandal. In, in, in Ridgeway a couple of years ago when, when this poster went up. The masterly retreat of the Queen's own. In the afternoon, the, Ridge, the Fenians actually take Ridgeway. And I've got to say one thing about the, the, the Fenians. Their behavior on the battlefield was nothing but gallant. Uh, they treated our wounded very well, and except with one incident, uh, behavior of the Fenians was exemplary. And, 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 and that has a lot to do with, with, with that epoch, with that moment, there were still last vestiges of gallantry, even though this was one of these bitter civil, you know, civil, colonial, you know, however you want to characterize the Irish aspiration for nationhood, um, uh, you know, those kinds of wars are often very dirty wars. Well, we were fortunate it didn't turn out to be that way here for us. In the afternoon, the Fenians, they, take, they go into Ridgeway, they hold Ridgeway uh, for a few hours. They take mostly small souvenirs, handkerchiefs, mostly. They don't loot, they don't destroy anything. And then they march into Fort Erie, where they fight another battle. 700 Fenians fight 72 Canadians. inside the streets of Fort Erie. It's a vicious battle. Canadians kill five Fenians by bayonet. The Fenians are actually shocked because nobody was getting killed by bayonet in the Civil War. I mean, bayonet wounds were unheard of in the Civil War. Canadians, of course, are fighting a theoretical war. Well, you know, once I fired my one round, I fixed my bayonet and I used my bayonet. And, and, and so as these Canadians are fighting from house to house inside of Fort Erie, they're bayoneting Fenians. Um, and, and, and the Fenians have never seen such a thing. My God, he's using a bayonet. It's, it's, it's a vicious, as you say, battle. And it's amazing that no Canadians are actually killed in it. Booker, he'll be blamed. He'll take the blame from McDonald. It's all Booker's fault. And there's a commission, a military inquiry, board of inquiry, and it's doctored. Booker is the only one allowed to pose questions. And essentially, the point of the commission is to clear MacDonald in a way that the system that allowed a Booker to command had to be protected. But Booker's own error would have to be exposed. And so MacDonald could not be blamed that a Booker is appointed. Uh, Booker will have to take the blame. And, and, and of course Booker now will, will creep out of Hamilton in shame, humiliated. He'll go to Montreal and then he'll mysteriously die at a very young age, several years after the battle. I suspect, uh, I suspect suicide. But in those days they just won't say. It's, it's unclear what kills Booker. But he's described as being totally burnt out by this battle. The Fenians, uh, O'Neill of course, the Fenians at the end of the day as the British now are approaching with artillery, the Fenians cross back towards Buffalo and who saves us? 
the United States Navy. The United States Navy cuts off Fenian supplies, it cuts off Fenian reinforcements, and it scoops up the 700 Fenians as they're trying to head back to Buffalo, it locks them up on the barge. And then the men are all paroled and they're sent home. O'Neill ends up in Nebraska, where he finds the town of O'Neill, Nebraska, the Irish capital of Nebraska, where every June 2nd, the town celebrates the Battle of Ridgeway and the conquest of Canada. While we forgot. Americans have recently raised the Fenian Invasion Monument across on the Buffalo side. The monument describes how the Fenians not only contributed to the founding of Ireland, but to the founding of Canada as well. Um, and in a way, you know, that could be argued because certainly the Fenian threat consolidates our need for confederation. Uh, our last reluctant opponents of confederation, of course, are swung by the Fenian invasion about the necessity of our being able to mobilize nationally. For Canadians, of course, uh, the Fenian casualties end up, as I say, our first nine casualties. In fact, 31 Canadians will die during the Fenian raids. Uh, the remaining die from their wounds or they die of disease contracted while in service. But the nine who are killed in action are buried in the necropolis in Toronto. Their graves have been recently restored by the regiment. Nobody else cares. It's only the regiment, the, there's QR, that are uh, curating these gravestones, taking care of them. And then, once the dead are buried and the wounded hidden, we don't want to talk about Ridgeway anymore. Nobody wants to be reminded of it. The mine men, boys, are forgotten. Ridgeway veterans are forgotten. City of Toronto puts up a monument in 1870 at Queen's Park, the Volunteers Monument, but nothing really happens there. These are actually the students who die. Tempest, medical student. He and his father are planning, his father has moved to Toronto because he and his father are planning, he's also a medical doctor, are planning to open a practice together, father and son. Tempest volunteers, is killed on the battlefield. In the evening his father volunteers to help the wounded and he finds his son dead. Breaks the family dies shortly after that. Broken heart, fatigue, families left destitute. I read through all the letters in the archives. They get pensions, some of them. 25 cents if you lost a limb. They're, they're all taking Manet round hits, so quite a lot of legs lost, arms lost. University College puts up a memorial window. Here's the monument standing across from Hart House. The men are ignored until they're in their middle ages. 1890, they're so fed up that you have a Fenian Raids Association and they gather at that monument on June 2nd as a protest and they hold the first Canada's first memorial Remembrance Day ceremony. They bury the monument in flowers. They decorate it. Decoration Day. It's an American tradition that begins with, with the Civil War. The British Empire has left dead soldiers like cobblestones in the street all over the world. Nobody mourned them. Nobody uh, remembered them. You know, that's a modern thing. Back then we didn't. This is this is the beginning of it, 1890. And in 1891, 50,000 people gathered at this place in memorial. And Wood, 
for the next 50 years. That's what it looks like today. In fact, we're hoping that the University of Toronto will allow the two regiments at 11 a.m. on May 28th to come and fire a salute. As you know, there's a firearms ban at UFT. And, and, and so we're having difficulties right now to let UFT clear us to come to these regiments. And they, these casualties as well, they're orphaned. Right? Because technically speaking, it's not Canada until Confederation. And, and as we talk to Ottawa, they're all saying, oh, you know, this is before Confederation. Uh, but the regiments have been in service since 1860. The regiments are older than Canada. And, and now their nine fallen comrades, their very first nine casualties, are orphaned from the regiment. Nobody will remember them. 